Hello, and welcome to an EdTech Talk discussion of Dave Cormier's Learning in a Time of Abundance. Uh, this is Jeff Lebo in Pusan, Korea. My name is Jennifer Madrill in Laval, Wisconsin. My name is John Schenker, and I'm in Stowe, Ohio. And I'm Dave Cormier. I'm in Windsor, Ontario, Canada. And we are a gang of old friends and ed tech talkers uh, who haven't been active in a while, but are gathered here to discuss Dave's new book. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about his introduction. But since it has been a while, and uh, it is possible that we might have new viewers. <laughs> well, it's possible we won't have any viewers, but uh, <laughs> some of them might be new. And in that case, we thought a little background information and introduction of ourselves might be in order. Um, I in, in Dave's introduction, he writes back about the early days of being locked out of a classroom and making the switch from textbook to internet in the late 90s. I was around for those days. Um, I was looking through our old messages and we were exchanging Netscape voicemails. I wasn't able to open them, but I'll download a codec and somehow hopefully figure that out. <laughs> there were mes mentions of 6 a.m. Uh, song room uh, outings and, and whatnot. Oh, yeah. But anyway, so we've been friends for a very long time. And in 2005, we started this little site called EdTech Talk that blossomed into a community of educators talking about ed tech stuff. Uh, I currently teach at a university in Pusan, Korea, uh, where um, I use technology in a variety of ways to torture my students and facilitate learning. That's me. Who are you, That's Jen? That's you. Uh, yes, I think I was next to the party. Um, I was in grad school. I was getting my master's at the time. And I needed a class project. And so I was a fangirl of uh, Ed Tech Talk. And so I wrote off and said, would you have a need for some assistance on your webcast? I think it was called at the time, right? Web webcast Academy, teaching folks how to um, use all the, the tools that were available for folks to do webcasting at the time. And um, yeah, I got a response back and, and then the rest is history. The, the next, uh, I guess we're saying like 19 years, I think then we've, uh, we've known each other. Uh, and I think in, in person, I've only met each of you once, which is still kind of, I think, kind of cool. Maybe Jeff, I've met you mm -hmm. twice, maybe. Yeah, I think maybe we did a conference or something. Um, so yeah, very, very close friends who really haven't had a chance uh, to meet so much in person, but um, spent tons of time uh, every Sunday night, right? For about 10 years plus, we were, we were together. Um, and so in, in the interim, after that first greeting, I continued my education, finished my PhD, um, and then I've started a nonprofit in the meantime, and I currently teach at University of Virginia. So that's my story. And I'm the relative newcomer. Um, I was a listener, started listening to the podcast in 2000, late 2005. And um, although some of you may differ, I, I had blogged about this, the, uh, the podcast not being quite so groundbreaking and that I was commenting on Jennifer being a breath of fresh air to the group and uh, was called out on it. I think the, the actual words were, so you think you can do better and, and was drafted to to uh, come talk to you guys and make fun of you. Every week. Um, I am I'm working in K-12 education for my whole career. This is the end of year 31 where I talked for six or eight years, uh, middle school and high school computer applications and and coding, and then have been the guy in charge of technology in, in public school districts since then. So worked in four different school districts now, and I've been in my current one for four years. And I'm basically responsible for all things tech, making all of that stuff work. But really, the exciting work is is what effect does this have on teaching and learning, and how do we do things with technology that we can't do without it? So that's been my focus for the last thirty years. Um, so my name is Dave Cormier. I currently work at the University of Windsor uh, as a learning specialist. I have a bit of a, I think of myself as an educational vagabond. I kind of wandered around a bit. I've worked, uh, I started working as a teacher uh, near Jeff and then eventually kind of close to Jeff. Um, and he did save my tail any number of times the first couple of years I was trying to do this. So I, I, I both blame 
and thank Jeff for starting me down the ed tech path many, many years ago. Um, and for me, this has always been about how the technology changes what it means to learn, like what it means to be in a classroom, what it means to do those things. And through being in, uh, I've done recruitment, retention, communications. I've been an educator. I've done ed tech inside the K-12 system. I've managed a med school for a while. I've done all kinds of different jobs and uh, always sort of peeking around, trying to figure out how the system works and how we can make it a little bit better, maybe. Uh, right now, I spend, I teach in the faculty of education at my university, and I also help faculty understand how the digital impacts their classrooms. And I just wrote a book. Which is why we're here. All right. Segway. That, segway. Was segway. that was beautiful. Right. That was beautiful. All right. So if the guys are okay, are you ready for me to jump in and fire some questions at our good friend Dave? Please do. All right. So Dave, let's start out with the title of the book, Learning mm -hmm. in a Time of Abundance. I like the title, but I like the second part better. Personally, a little editorial comment here. The community is the um, curriculum. Uh, but I think we're going to spend a lot more time, at least in my, my series of questions, um, we're focusing in on the introduction and we'll, I think, oh, I don't think we mentioned this, but our plan is to continue this as a, as a weekly installment going through sections of the book. And we're just kind of starting out slowly here, um, going through the introduction and we're going to spend a lot of time, um, talking more about the abundance part of this, of your, of your title, if that's okay with you. And you certainly can, you know, add some other things to that. Um, but let's start out with a kind of a softball here. You're, you've been a blogger for a long time. We've just kind of gone through your history of being a, a webcaster. You know, why a book? Well, you know, when I kind of I, in my questions here, which I gave you a chance to look at, I kind of sarcastically <laughs> said, uh, were your blog posts too confining? Did you need more, you know, more space, more words? But yeah, kind of, <laughs> kind of give it us, give us the, the reason why, your motivations. Why, why did you write the book? There are, there are probably three things. Uh, the first thing is I've always wanted to write a book. I started trying to write one when I was 22. Uh, it's still out there somewhere. The it, I tried and failed and started a publishing company with the whole idea that I was going to publish books my whole life. Um, so there's always been this sort of thought in the back of my head that sometime on my to-do list was getting a book written. Um, there's a person at a conference about five years ago came up to me and went, I just can't. It's not enough time. Did you write a book or something? And I was like, I... I suppose I could do that. And literally that was the whole part of that conversation. And it just stuck with me. Um, also, I've been trying to explain the same kinds of things for a long time. And I find that it is too confining. The blogs are too confining. I'm afraid to say that. I know you're joking, but I think you're right. <laughs> um, I just, I wanted to try to, I've, I've been thrown a number of people's books over the years and gone, we'll just read this. Um, in that here's this big concept that somebody is trying to explain and get through it. So I wanted to at least sort of take the work that, that I've tried to do and the thoughts that I've stolen from all my friends and put them together into one spot so I could sort of say, like, this is the piece I'm trying to, this is what I'm trying to say. Um, and in a way that um, one could be brought to other people. So like the people who have come back to me and talked to me about the book so far, most of them are not educators. Most of them are not my colleagues. Most of them are just random people in my life that I happen to know at some level who read a book in a way that would have never read a blog post, right? So it, it reaches another group of people that I would never, ever do. And the fifth of my three reasons is that it's on the vague hope that it ends up on a policymaker's desk because my blog is never going to get there. Um, but there's a chance that the book does. And so it's another chance, another another attempt at trying to impact the discussion in the field in the ways that I think are important. Well, yeah. on the title, I'm just curious, yeah, exactly. when did you cement the title? Did you start with Ooh. it? Did it occur along the way or at the end? Uh, I had a bunch of different ones. It the um, uh, Lee Scalar Pissette, um, who you guys might know from, uh, I think it's Times Higher Ed. One of the, she's a writer anyway, she works at, um, at Georgetown. Uh, and candles. She and I had been talking about this and I'd, I was about two months into starting to write the book. And she goes, what are you trying to talk about? We went back and forth and back and forth. And I'm like, oh, basically it's abundance. That's the thing that I'm actually talking about. And once I had that, I basically had a version of the title. It went through a bunch of variations and the community as curriculum has been part of it from the beginning that I always knew that it's the underlying concept of all the work that I've been trying to do. So it's, it's sort of the, do you remember forward. any of the alternatives? 
I have a list of them somewhere. Uh, okay, I'll get well, them for we'll the put next that show. In the show notes. We'll put them in the show notes. Yeah, I have a list of them somewhere. <laughs> I had tried them out, and there's a whole bunch of crazy things that uh, that were in there, but I'll uh, I'll get them in. You know what? I'm going to go off script for my next question. I want to loop John in because uh, this is like before we even get to the introduction. There, your acknowledgments. And uh, very prominently uh, described, you said that uh, John was instrumental in kind of keeping the project moving. Um, at least that's the way I interpreted what you were saying. So, did you have any comments on that? And John, if you wanted to kind of I, talk about your your involvement, I think he I think he over overstated my contributions. I I just kept asking when the book is going to be done because I want to buy the book and hand it to people and say you need to read this because. <laughs> I mean, we've known Dave for almost 20 years now. Trying to summarize Dave is really hard to do. It's easier to hand someone a book. So I just kept saying, I need the book. Where's the book? And, you know, do you need me to read a chapter? Do you need me to make some comments? And then he foolishly allowed me to read some of it many times. And uh, gave him some comments, and that created an extra year's work for him. Um, but it was it was fun to go through that process, especially knowing Dave and knowing what he's trying to say and knowing how he talks and how he vlogs it. And really, the book is a different voice. It's still very much Dave, but it's a different voice from what you would hear on a podcast or what you would read in a blog post. And so it, it was kind of fun watching that transformation from Dave talking things out and getting them on onto the screen and then watching that become a book was really cool. In the spirit of keeping traditions alive, John, I don't love your audio. Oh, this is so oh, that feels good. <laughs> this is warm it's, um, it's a little tinny. Like I'm wondering if you're using the onboard mic. You can I'd like to go me. back like while John is figuring out his audio. Um, he's a bold faced liar. Um, he <laughs> did an awful lot on, on a detailed level, on a day to day level, having somebody who um who trusts you enough to tell you how bad something is is essential for this kind of pro, pro this kind of project. And there are a bunch of different moments where John was like, no, no, no. First, is this no. any better? I think so. Audio wise. Uh, uh, maybe. Uh, what do we think? Uh, a little tinny. Uh, yeah. It's still a little tinny. Oh, okay. Um, hmm. That's all of the microphones that I have right here. It, is it an like are you on a laptop? Yeah. I feel like it's using the onboard mic. And it's just it your was. distant. It was using the onboard mic, and I switched to this mic. That sounds it is better. better. It sounds better. Yep. Okay. All right. I was just doing oh, this is, know, this is, this sake. is oh, a blast from the past. Just like the old <laughs> days. Yeah, That's right? Like, you know, I tried to get the, the camera as bad as possible, too. But... <laughs> and, and we should get on the record. Do you have pants on? <laughs> That's right. No. Oh God! No. I wish you'd have no. answered that. You have I really <laughs> wish that you know, that went. <laughs> See, so this yeah, is what John you get for watching the video. By the way, Dave and I met with me making fun of them, right? That's so, true. I I can't be anything. I can't give him any feedback except here's my reaction to the thing that I'm reading. Um, and actually, I, I've I do that with a lot of people, and some of them are appreciative of that and very gracious about it and some of them are really not um, <laughs> but that that's all i can do is here let me read this and look at it through my lens and i'll let you know what i think and then you're going to go make of it what you will so plus his grammar is really strong which is actually really helpful as well um which i didn't know at all but he's uh he's got he's one of those people who has a really good eye for the mistakes of others take that however you like <laughs> um <laughs> But he did a really nice job of picking out a lot of sort of just badly formed paragraphs and that kind of stuff too. So it was really helpful. And his audio is better. And since we're slow walking this a bit, let's not overlook mom. The dedication oh. uh, is for my mother who still teaches me how to face uncertainty, oh. which implies that you <clears throat> this uncertainty is not a new thing, that you no. have grown up with uncertainty. Anything you'd like to say to mom? Yeah. So my mother is, uh, my mother was my baseball coach and my hockey coach. Um, my mother taught an entire years of hockey players how to stop both ways, but could only do it one way. She taught us all how to do wrist shots in hockey, but didn't know how to do it herself. Um, she fixed my pitching stance, having never pitched in her life. Um, she's one of these people who can just look at a situation, will try hard enough at it and just beat it until it submits. Um, and in a super optimistic and super positive way. 
Um, John spent a lot of time around my mother and probably has a sense for what that looks like. Dave's um, mom is awesome. My, Dave's mom and my wife are besties online. <laughs> and, That's true. <laughs> and it's hilarious because they they met on that one occasion for a weekend. And uh, I think it's more than anything else, Teresa does not care to have filters. And she's going to tell you what she sees and the way it is and what you need to do and you're going to do it or not. And if you don't, then you're wrong. Even so, if in this case, you happens to be the lawnmower uh, following one phone call, which is just before I wrote this dedication. I got a phone call from my mother and she's like, I had a chat with a lawnmower today. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> and she goes, I was out and it stopped running while I was mowing the lawn. My father passed away a few years ago. So mom is now taking over all these tasks and learning how not only to drive the lawnmower, but to repair it. So she goes, I had the laptop out on top of the, or I guess iPad out on top of the lawnmower, going through YouTube videos, trying to figure out how to fix it. And it fixed right after I had a serious conversation with it and told it that if it did not fix, I was going to take it back and get another one. And that was the last thing she had to say to it. Apparently it worked after that. So. And it worked. Yeah, it did. <laughs> All right. I think we can move on to sentence number two. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. okay. Well, let's circle back uh, to uh, the comments you were making about audience a little bit. And um, mm -hmm. when we, over all the years we did, I'm going to give a little preface to the question. Over the, all the years we did EdTech Weekly, it was very much for an, an, an audience of geeks, really. Even yeah. I think even just like in a general educators would have even been a little <laughs> unsure of what we were talking about. Sorry. I don't think we always knew what we were talking about. So what is it like kind of that process of writing for a more general audience, yet kind mm -hmm. of keeping that same important message that you're trying to drive through that you've been, like you said, talking about for years? That's a great question. Um, some of it was, I had a couple of people in my head who I was thinking about and trying to explain this to. Um, I think over the years, having started out a lot of my talks talking about French postmodernism and rhizomes and a whole bunch of other stuff, I got to the point where I realized that having to explain everything to someone first so they can understand the context before you can explain something to them, it's not very helpful. So the, the that was the voice I was trying to find for the book was we're talking about a, a really complex system in education an extraordinarily complex concept and learning, and then trying to talk to people in their everyday lives for how they've seen this. Because one of the criticisms that I have for a lot of educational theory is it talks about education as if it's removed from life. Um, well, it talks about learning as if it's removed from life. Um, and education system necessarily kind of is, but we learn all the time, right? So one of the things I talk about in the book, you know, you can learn to be a bad person. Um, learning is something we do automatically. And I think there's something in everybody's everyday experience where we have a connection to learning. And it was that piece I was trying to reach so that I could provide some context for the overall concept. So it took some work. Um, the, the John and Lori were helpful with that. The editors were helpful with that. And then just, I had my sister in my head the whole time, right? I'm, she's smart. Um, but she doesn't know anything about the field and she's pig headed. So I was really trying to convince her. <laughs> has she read the book and what does she think? She read a draft actually, um, before it went in. Um, I got very rapid responses. My sister doesn't have, doesn't spend a lot of time on any one issue. She's perfect as a judge actually, because she can take in all the information, give a ruling and then move on. Um, and she was the same way with the book. She gave a lot, a lot of good feedback actually. She, um, she followed along. So she enjoyed it. She's a bit more straight line and rigid than I am, though. So some of the uh, wandery approaches to education are probably not quite her thing. I think my comment last week was, I noticed your sentences were very short, and I was very surprised by that. <laughs> <laughs> Either you had a real, like an editor. Was... <laughs> no, it was me. It was, it was very, I very much tried to write that way. I was trying to write in a sort of quick staccato way that made it approachable and sounded... Um, and, and sort of space the language out so that it sounded, I've never really thought about this consciously. So if I'm kind of wandering all over the place, I apologize, but I was looking for this sort of conversational tone so that when you read it, you'd kind of be fighting with me in your head the whole time. Um, and that's, or agreeing with me or coming out. And it's, it's, it's been, it's kind of worked out because I've had like a few dozen people come back to me and, and talk to me about the book 
and I can tell that they were having a whole conversation because some of the stuff they're coming to me with is not in the book. Um, like there's a whole other piece they're bringing to it too. Uh, in my is... mind, I challenged you on this and then you rebutted with that. That's and right. now I'm going to. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. That's cool. All and right. Did you say I... education is separated from real life? Yeah, totally. I the system learning, of education. Learning you... and school are separate. Yeah. Can you so... elaborate on that? Sure. When I talk about education, I mean, I'm not saying this is every definition of education, but the one that I use in the book is that education is when you're talking about the system. So teachers and schools and curricula and all the rest of that. And learning is the thing that happens to humans. And if you look at um, just uh, today, we got a new announcement that cell phones are not allowed in schools in Ontario, which they announced three years ago, too, and two years ago, too. They keep announcing it. Um, but it's just there's no way to talk about the way that people learn without the internet anymore. Like it, it's just not real life. Um, and so having learning happen separately from that or education happen without that to me is another one of those cases where we step away from the way people learn in their regular lives or will work, learn in their work lives or in any of the other parts of their life. Because so you're with the way the idea. education system currently is not necessarily That's that right. it has to be. Yeah. I don't think it has to be. I understand that you end up with some structure, like you need to put some structure in place. Like kids have to be bussed around places, maybe. Um, there are buildings and John will tell you that you need to connect wires to things or something. I don't know. Um, but uh, None of which I mean, necessitates gotta... being separated from real life. It doesn't. It really does. I mean, good teachers have been doing this for generations. I'm not suggesting it doesn't happen in any classrooms. Um, but I know a lot of people who think of, you know, we're just shoving facts into people's heads. Um and that's what we should be doing, right? That's their perspective. That's that's what doing your job means. Um, yeah, which is not the way anybody lives their life. Got, got your answer, Jeff? Yes, thank you. Okay, Page okay. two. <laughs> <laughs> it's so weird to have a script. Um, okay, so now let's let's kind of <laughs> we got through the learning in the title. <laughs> let's work our way. We don't have to do time. We're, we're I don't think. End. <laughs> I think we can skip that. So let's just hop right into abundance. So actually mm -hmm. in my notes, I talked about abundance. I interpret that as being abundance of information. Mm -hmm. um, so can you kind of take us through, are you speaking of other things besides abundance of information or what, what do you, what is your, what are your thoughts on abundance that you're trying to uh, describe to us? I fudged that throughout the book. You caught me. Um, so I do, it is definitely information abundance and the separation between information scarcity and information abundance, I think is one of those fundamental shifts that's happened to us. Um, I also think there's an, there's an abundance of connection as well that goes along with that. So I was talking to a bank manager today about her daughter's cell phone usage. Not sure why this keeps happening to me, um, but how, and I was saying that, you know, they're in constant contact and there's something exhausting about that. And there's some, there's an expectation that comes along with that. And there's an abundance of connection that comes in with that. That's very, very different than what my childhood was like, right? I spent a lot of time waiting to meet my friends um, or having just left my friends and they don't have that experience or they're waiting and their friends could be connecting and they're not right. Whereas when my friends weren't connecting with me, there was no chance for them to do so anyway. So I wasn't in that constant sort of space where I was knowing that I was being ignored, whether they are or not. Um, and I think that that abundance of connection, uh, for instance, is another place in which the, the, the technologies really change the way that we interact at a social level. Um, and I think it changes, like there's all kinds of ways that connection changes things. Like there are lots of people now who never actually learn anything for themselves. All they do is ask someone else because they're never actually alone because they'll just, how do I do this? Tick. Um, so yeah, I think that abundance spreads out, but it's all about the way that the digital sort of provides and over provides as the case may be. Yeah. And, and one thing that I really walked away um, was this idea that it's, it is a new reality. It's more than just having yeah. information because we've had especially now, like we've had decades where we have Wikipedia, where people were, you know, were kind of freaked mm -hmm. out by that. And what does that mean? They still and are. They still, still are, are, right? And, you know, Google will uh, let you go all, off into all kinds of different directions and tangents. But I think you're really 
the way I interpret it again is like, like really like now that we, we do have a new reality where yeah. this is just, you know, we were kind of joking before we signed on that, you know, we've been doing this 20 years. Some folks haven't even, <laughs> maybe weren't even born that are now going to be teachers pretty soon. But uh, so what, what folks who are, have grown up with this and now this is their reality, um, I, can you want to speak to that at all? Like what, how you how you frame that? Um, because I think that was mentioned several times in the introduction that it's like our new reality. Yeah, I think the ways like there's a bunch of examples in there where we talk about how like I talk about going to the doctor and how being a doctor has changed so much in the last because I and I'm basing that on like the 10 months I spent in med school. Uh, but I talked to a lot of doctors and this is a conversation I kept bringing up and like, especially for emergency doctors, the experience is so different. You know, people come in and go, I have this. And then often, usually they're wrong, or at least partially wrong or kind of wrong or right, but don't understand the context or whatever that is. And so they don't have the authority they used to have. There are other ways in which them lacking that authority is probably okay, um, because there are ways in which no doctor can know everything. And I think there are certainly doctors who took advantage of that. Um, that sort of one way, one directional sort of approach to information, right? They had it and they could withhold it or give it when they wanted to. But our experience with doctors has fundamentally changed in that way. The power structure has changed. The ability of people to find out about things and coming in with those different perspectives has really changed. And because now, if you have a feeling, you can spend four hours on a variety of websites discussing what that feeling might be. And so any of these and then all of the Facebook reels or Instagram reels or TikToks or whatever you happen to do will all start getting filled with whatever that is, thereby reinforcing whatever it is, whatever dark hole you've gone down. It's because the abundance comes at you from all these different ways. So you've had this thought, you jump in as you jump into the internet and start finding out about it. And then you start getting remarketing on Facebook from some company that sells pills for that. And then like, it all comes at you. Right. And we're just, there's nothing that we've done to prepare us for that. Yeah. And we don't it, have any tools. And so one thing, you, I don't think you mentioned this in your example that you, that you drew from your, from the introduction uh, with the doctor example. I think it also comes into play in terms of what does a doctor need to learn when they have right. at their disposal, you know, iPad or whatever it is that they're standing in front of the patient with. So how now making this uh, kind of segue now getting into thinking about from an educational standpoint, from a learning mm -hmm. standpoint, we spent countless weeks um, on our prior years of webcast talking about what it means to learn and how we should be teaching and what it means to be a good learner. So kind of helping us, for, you know, to foreshadow what you're going to be talking about in subsequent chapters of the book, um, how does an abundance of information um, impact these issues I just mentioned, both positively and negatively, just kind of throw some at us just to kind of give us a sense of how this is covered in the book. And just to add to that question, in the book, you talk about the disdain patients might have for a doctor who's using his phone to look something up. And my reaction was, no, I'd actually have disdain for a doctor who's not using AI or not using tools. And mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm a typical patient or not, but just you that was my thought related to that question. Well, but then you're, you know, are you disagreeing with the doctor if they land on a different site from the one that you went to? And so they determine that you actually don't have cancer. Ultimately, I want but, them to have reliable medical GPT <laughs> right? they can use. I'm not sure reliable fits with all those other words, but we'll, we'll, we can... <laughs> that's in another chapter. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we're getting ahead of ourselves. That's chapter eight. Just, <laughs> just the fact that we've come up with four different ways of looking at this to me is indicative of the problem. Right. So whatever way you look at it, like we all have these different the, the relationships we have with doctors used to be pretty set. Right. You'd go to the doctor. The doctor would tell you what was wrong or they wouldn't because they didn't know. But then you were done. You could get a second opinion. And we have that sort of cultural idiom that that's out there about getting a second opinion. But that involved you going to a doctor and having them tell you whether or not you had something wrong with you. That was the whole relationship. We couldn't have opinions about which way it should work. Right. And that's where. When you look at the way that I haven't answered your question yet, Jen, but that's because we are distracted by these other comments. <laughs> we have an abundance of questions. Yeah. We have an abundance of questions. So I think that that's another thing we have to worry about, right? And I think part of the whole landscape here 
and I didn't say a lot of this in the book because I'm not a psychiatrist, but I think a lot of the landscape here of anxiety here is about how many choices people need to make. And you don't just make the decision to go to the doctor. You have all these other contexts around how you go to the doctor. What do I want from them? What do I expect from them? What's this relationship going to be? What do I need to read before I get there? How much do I trust this person? Should I go to that? And that doesn't even mention alternative medicine and all this other stuff that's out there around people's uh, health as well. To go back to Jen's question, which is going to be restated by Jen, I hope. So I'm actually getting it right. <laughs> yeah. I had no, it in my yeah, head there yeah. for a minute. Just... And just... <laughs> no, so, yeah, you know, we we're just kind of talking generally about abundance of information. You use the doctor mm -hmm. example. And so oh, I was yeah. saying, how do they learn? Yeah. So how, how do they learn? How do we teach? Um, what, it, what does it mean to be a good learner? Which I think is mm -hmm. kind of a, we could have a whole section on all of these topics, but just kind of as a preview of kind of how, how you frame sure. these things within the book. Um, what so your general thoughts? I want to drop a couple of pieces of context here. Um, most of the cognitive science literature around how we should teach will tell us that we should uh, really focus on background knowledge before we get into any higher level thinking. Like you need the background knowledge before you can do anything else. That setup for learning is a setup for experts, right? So that's me learning about science so I can get a PhD in that kind of science. It doesn't work for any of the rest of us who don't become experts in whatever field we're learning. Cause then we may learn like, I don't, maybe John has used a lot of calculus in his life, but I have not. Um, and we learn all these things with the expectation that we might take that pathway to expertise, but there's a, there's an opportunity cost there of deepening our knowledge on things that we might actually use. Um, and because of that, they're looking at the success of chess players, for instance. So if you're developing a good chess player, they need to memorize everything so they can have all of the moves in their head, so they can see all the moves, right? It's a closed idea, it's a game with ways to win and lose, but those are the models that the that end of the field would want us to follow, right? Because they're looking to build the scientists of tomorrow, whereas I don't think our particularly K-12 schools are in the business of preparing our scientists for tomorrow. I'd like them to do good with citizens who can make good decisions on regular everyday things. So saying that, I don't think our education system should be designed overall to make doctors. We do that in doctor school. So the thing I have to say about doctor school doesn't necessarily apply to everything else is the point I'm trying to make. But doctor school, um, I don't know why I love saying that so much, but I really do, um, <laughs> is um, there's a whole lot of sort of facty business that you need to put into your head according to the way that the system is set up though most of them are looking are moving towards a competency-based approach rather than a fact-based approach. So all medical schools all around the world are making that transition. Um, we have traditionally said, you need to learn this background knowledge. Now, the truth is it's this background knowledge amongst this much knowledge. And the small amount that I can show you in two years, which is in Canada at least, the amount of time you spend before you go and do your first placement, is maybe the same size, but the overall size of what's available has expanded exponentially around it. So while we could do it the same way, what we're going to find is doctors increasingly need to go beyond that basic knowledge to be able to answer the sort of day-to-day -day questions that they're dealing with. So and that's not a, to say that, go ahead. Instead of a, a year three med student knowing 1% of all of the stuff they're no, they now know 0.001% because you can't, you can't keep them in med school for a hundred years. That's right. Which is not to say that there aren't definitely skills that we should just train people to do. So I'll give you an example. I bought a lot of pig's feet while I was at the med school. Uh, you buy them in bulk, you put them in the freezer and the students take them out, put slices in them and use them to practice suturing. I There's no other way around learning how to suture, but suturing. And there are lots of skills in the med school that you should definitely just friggin' practice until you get it right. I have a terrible stitch in this left hand from when I put a chisel into my hand two years ago, which will tell you that there's at least one med student who did not learn how to stitch. In all fairness, uh, that was your mom. <laughs> it was not. <laughs> um, but I, so I'm not saying there aren't skills you should train. I'm saying that overall, we're getting a smaller and smaller subset of what's overall available. It doesn't mean there aren't core skills. It doesn't mean there aren't, like, I'm still, 
there are people who would argue against me, but I still think memorizing things like times tables is useful. I think there's a subset of things that are just useful to memorize. It's just an understanding that that subset is not going to help you with life as much as it would have 50 years ago. So what uh, will, and I've, Oh, so imagine like learning with the abundance, right? So what we need to learn how to do. So, and again, uh, using the everyday example here of the, the heat pump that I bought for my house in December, um, my furnace stopped. I've been kind of thinking about trying to change the way my house gets heated, but I had vaguely thought about it. And then suddenly I have like six hours to try to make a decision and trying to pull in enough information and sift through all of the marketing that's involved and try to understand where I'm being misled, where there are bad actors who are trying to influence me. And then eventually at some point, there's no right answer. You just have to decide. That's what real life looks like. And I think the more we do that in our classrooms, the more we help our students with scaffolding and structure and feedback on how they make decisions about how they learn the more they're going to be prepared for dealing with all this abundance. And the kind of navigating their way through, like I'd rather have a doctor who's really good at finding the connections he needs to make to diagnose me than someone who can suture well, because eventually they're going to be using the suture Tron 300 that <laughs> does it perfectly every time. But yeah, I want I mean, you to be I... able to find the information, connect to the expert, have AI analyze my x-rays or whatever to get the best outcome. What's interesting you say that because there's a lot of the stuff they teach is about flowchart decision making. So when you look at if, um, I don't know if there are any house fans, but it's never lupus. Um, but they have a, a way of at, like you do a test and that test breaks off this part of flowchart. You do a test that breaks off this part. So that you slowly whittle down from what it could be based on what you're seeing through testing to what it might be. Um, and it's not accurate. I mean, anybody who's been to the doctor with something that isn't visibly broken will tell like it's often a journey, but it's all flowcharts. So a uh, system, it doesn't have to be AI, actually. It just could be like a literal algorithmic system that just sort of helps you down the flowchart. And they're kind of using that anyway. Um, the AI part scares me a little more than it scares you, Jeff. Um, again, like, haven't studies the, the, shown that AI is better at analyzing a lot like x-rays or different medical tests and it's early on. I mean, you've got to think that's going to get better. I mean, I'm, I'm sure there are tasks that it can do better. I think what, again, those back of the napkin conversations with the doctors would tell me is that if they had the chance of knowing everything or convincing their patients to do what they were told, 100% of them chose convince my patients to do what they're told, which is not something the AI system is going to do. So to me, I think the identification part is important, but it's really not the job. Unless which implies surgeon. they should be learning more social skills and negotiation skills. I would love that. That'd be fantastic. And actually, those those courses don't go over very well inside the med schools, as I understand it, certainly in, in the med school I worked in and, and others I've talked about, because those kids have been brought up. They're, they're the ones who got 100 on everything, right? They're the ones who've been rewarded for getting everything right, for having the right answer to the question. And so you bring them into the socialness of medicine class, and suddenly they're like, uh, what do you want me to do? What's the question? What's the test? How do I get, how do I get 100 on this? So the idea of exploring their field, like not all of them, there's some amazing students that I work with who were more than ready to jump on that journey, but a lot of them were not. That's hard to teach too. It kind of raises the question of expertise, which I think might be the next question. It is. You guys just keep teeing up these segues for me. Yeah. So this is a bit of a pivot um, to kind of drilling down now in the additional themes that were covered in the intro that you're, we can let you refine a little bit here as a preview but yeah if we have all this information out there kind of what Jeff was saying like who put it there and like uh, who, who's the expert that put it there and mm. how do we measure expertise how do we fact check how do we determine what are our trusted sources so how does that play into your book and what we're going to be hearing in future chapters I think that's the hardest I mean and then we I think at some level we've always done this badly so like when I was in 
high school, I was told to look at the publisher and the city the publisher was from, and somehow that was relevant. But nobody ever explained to me why or how I was supposed to decide whether or not it was a publisher who I should trust. Like, I, how would I know that anyway? Um, I can understand its validity to people who are already experts. And ChatGPT is a perfect example. ChatGPT is great if you're already an expert in the topic you're searching. Man, it pulls stuff together fast. And you're like, you go through it and you're like, nope, uh, this is good. That's fine. Nope. And you can go through it and you can pull it out and you've got a document ready and you're good to go. Right? It's great in that sense. If you're, it's just filling in the typing um, and putting it together in a structure that's tidy and then you can kind of edit and you go along. I think the internet's the same, right? So if you're already an expert, then you're not going to get tricked by all of these things that take you outside of that context. Most of us, all of us are not expert at something. Most of us are not expert at anything. Um, and so that puts you in a really bad position. If your only tool is using expert tools to evaluate everything and you ain't got them, then it's just, it's a free for all, right? So there's really great methods out there for fact-checking. Certainly the SIF method that Michael Caulfield pulled together is the one that people point to the most. Um, and that's fine if the thing you're looking for has a right answer. Uh, but if it's, um, how do I impact poverty in my home city? Which are real life questions that I would love for us to be more worried about in our schools. I mean, we do projects. Certainly my kids have come home with projects they've done and stuff like that. But they're projects that have right answers inside the school that get graded for getting the, the right way, even though we know those don't work inside of our cities. Yeah, and I think um, the, the third part of what I was mentioning uh, or asking about was the you know, expert expertise and fact checking, but the, the trusted sources piece. Yeah. Um, we went through that with COVID. You know, like, <laughs> right? We're getting our information, you know, we get, we used to get our parents' generation listen to like Walter Cronkite every now and now we're listening to Joe Rogan um, or a countless number or, of other podcasters. Like, who do we? Um, you know, who do we get our information from and who do we trust? Yeah. Yeah. And it's, this, this foreshadows for later, but the whole idea of research, like I did my research, um, is just, it's every time I hear it now, it gets terrifying. I always sit with my students, I always force them to go, did you search or did you research? Like, let's just yeah. calm down a little bit here. Um, research is something you can do if you have expertise. Searching is what you're doing without it. Uh, and there are definitely ways of searching better or worse. And there are sources that I trust, but they're based on my values, right? So I think mostly the New York Times does a reasonable job. There's a whole swath of people in your country who do not believe that, um, right? And for them, that newspaper doesn't reflect their values. Part and it's not about truth, it's about values. Sources too. You know, in, in the mid 20th century, you have three news sources. So as long as they're all on the same page, that is truth because that's the only source you have. Um, yeah. I think now with this many voices, you know, it's like like having two watches. You're never really sure what time it is. And and the more voices we have, the more opportunities there are for people to attack any single one of those because they disagree with it. And and there's more people to be in the vacuum of people who believe the thing that you're believing. Yeah. Right. So I always think of flat earthers who are amongst the most mysterious of groups to me, because I can't imagine how you can live on a round planet and think it's flat. Um, but they do. And there's enough of them to all convince each other that they do. Um, and there's enough of that sort of group thing to pull together. And there are enough people out there who will say, don't trust authority. And of course, sometimes you should not trust authority. You know, it's it's a complex situation, but well, I guess, I guess too that's that that abundance of connection because they can find each other in ways that that's they right. couldn't twenty yeah. years ago, for sure. I'm Where terrified think... of the current misinformation landscape, but oh, yeah. part of me is a little bit optimistic, like answering how how do I deal with poverty is. in my town? He's so I feel I like there's the potential. So great for the tools to analyze like, this is how a million different communities have dealt with it and these are the outcomes and here is some neutral analysis that is based on data now how you choose to accept that data is you know going to be related to values and what you want to hear but like mm -hmm. the potential to get not the answer but useful 
neutral information exists or will exist, won't it? I would argue that it won't. Um, I mean, I I can't tell you that it won't, but certainly that's the the dream of the meta study, right? Um, so if I take 800 studies, so uh, John Hattie is famous for writing a book about 800 studies about education, right? It's the classic massive meta study. I've looked at so many versions of education. I can tell you what improves learning the most. Um, the problem is, is each one of those 800 studies has measured learning slightly differently in a slightly different context that when you put them together, the ideas don't it doesn't they would they would argue that because i've done lots of them it levels out which is true if the thing you're counting is a counting noun so if you do 800 mega studies on the number of mosquitoes in a community right there's an actual number of mosquitoes you could count maybe you can't but there is an actual number right there's a real fact that you can find out and people's ability to study those mosquitoes are going to balance out. And then you're going to get a number that works out. If you don't believe that learning can be counted, which I don't, then you're not measuring learning. You're measuring the way a test measures people's recall of something that happened in a classroom with a random person in front of them. So you're not actually, and that's the same thing with poverty. The, the, the thing you're going to have to measure is going to be what? The number Policy of people who go to actions a... given certain variables and resulting outcomes. But the messiness is on all the things that you didn't tell me. So at some level, are you counting the number of people who go to a um to a community food place? Because if you are, that might be indicative of the community food places working well, or it might be indicative of the fact that there's more poverty in that city. So the measurement you take doesn't give you that information. It's a number you can count, but it doesn't have the context to it, right? That's the problem with a meta study is at some level, if the thing you're meta studying is recovery rates for people to be able to go back to running after they have a meniscus tear, at some level, there's a real number in the world that tells us whether or not someone ran again after a meniscus tear, which is why we do a lot of meta studies in, in the sciences and in medicine. But when you talk about poverty, it's not, I can't have seven poverties. I can have number of people below the poverty line, right? And I can measure whether or not they're getting a certain amount of money. They can kind of do that, but then you're measuring money. You're not measuring, you know what I mean? Like it's always, yeah. The, the... you know, it's not going to be uh, perfect, but I feel like there's still, even in qualitative matters, useful information that can be gained, not a definitive decision, but you know, on a smaller level, sure. it's, okay, neighboring community A did this and neighboring community B did that and A worked better. Okay, that's my meta study. So but worked you better, that ends up being okay, hard yeah. to know. Yeah, okay. And just to like step back, just a tip. Where's your common sense, young man? <laughs> oh, no, no. You, so you know it when you see it. In, in, so in my dissertation, one of the things I looked at, I looked at the measures of the community of inquiry. So it's uh, perceptions of students looking at their cognitive presence, social presence, and teaching presence against a learning outcome. So when you look at, as, as Dave's saying, at the vast number of people who've looked at the community of inquiry, they look at learning in terms of learner perception. And some of the measures almost look like satisfaction. Some of them are tests, some of them are GPA, some of them are completion, some are persistence, All, but they're still calling it in some way, shape or form learning. And so when we did ours, we had definitions for perceived learning and we had uh, definitions for an, a more of an objective matter, measure, meaning something that the teacher gave. There was no correlation between the, te the learner's perception of whether they learned and an objective measure of the teacher. There just was none. However, there was a, almost a perfect correlation between satisfaction and perceived learning. So here, all these studies are out there <laughs> studying perceived learning. They're, they're studying satisfaction. And it had nothing to do with whether the, you know, some of the, the, we had three measures of uh, objective measures of learning. And one of them was the teacher saying, basically from your gut, do you feel this person can walk out in the world and do what you taught them to do in this class? Like, will they be able to do what the, the uh, you know, objective measures of, that you were attempting to teach them in this class? And again, like there was no, there was no correlation. Uh, did you control that. that number for gender? Oh, we probably did. Yeah. it's Because I'd be really curious to know how much. 
that differs by gender, whether or not the dudes in the class are like, yeah, I taught them great and they'll be fine. And whether or not there's a. <laughs> yeah. But, but to kind of, I hopefully that kind of ties into what you're saying and, and Jeff to kind of answer oh. your question. Like what they, everybody in all these prior studies that we were we kind of had in our lit review, they all said that they were examining learning, but then you really kind of drill down with their measure of learning was all over the place. Has the age of abundance made this more difficult to solve poverty? Like, I don't feel like we had great answers before. And now because of the abundance, it's harder. I feel like if anything, we've got at least more data, even if it's not totally reliable and it's wonky in some ways. There's two answers to that. First, like Riddle and Weber from the 70s would tell you that that's asking the wrong question, that you can't solve for something like poverty because it's a wicked well, problem. Well, he's not on the show and it's our show and we you get to ask whatever question you want. With a, you can only <laughs> deal with a small part of any one of these problems. And asking the big question is always the thing that gets you into trouble um, because you can't solve it because we can't even agree on what it is. Um, I think that the more the extra data helps in some cases and in other cases it just like when i look at education specifically it's a nightmare because every single person who wants to make an argument can pull out a paper to support that argument they can pull out 20 papers they can pull out a hundred papers to support whatever random position they might have um like i i play this game with my students all the time right where i'll come up and i'll give them one side of an argument and say oh go look for this and then i'll give them the other side and they're like we just read all this unbiased objective literature that said that this was true and then we go and they're like well this all says that it's false how can like what's the right answer and the answer of course is that i don't know if there's a right welcome answer. to dave's class right on the day's class I don't know. you just still have to decide what Josh, you're going to do in your Josh class over there <laughs> yeah um but that's that's the problem with abundance right is like anything it's the joe rogan thing right like if you're looking for uh, a reason to have someone not mask, you can find one study somewhere that proves one thing. And then a bunch of people will know that they're going to get attention by following up that study with another one. So somebody else is going to make one. And suddenly you have 20 studies that all go, were based on what happened in like the flaws in one, I'm making this part up now, but the flaws in one manufacturer's mask technique that's been extrapolated to all masks or takes the idea of masking out of context or um, claims that if someone wears a mask, somebody else can still get sick, which is of course true. It's that it reduces it statistically and it has a statistical impact on the population is the point, but that's a subtle point. It's boring, but with abundance, you can find somebody to contradict that. I'm sure we could pull up a paper that totally contradicts what I just said. That's the problem and everybody can find it. And so if you're only looking for the things that support your existing position, um, you can find that. Whatever that well, I'm going to keep hope alive and see if it lasts <laughs> until chapters. That's why we love you. <laughs> so good. <laughs> All right. So we've got about uh, under 10 minutes here. So I'm going to tee up one last theme for you that uh, runs throughout the book. And you said actually runs throughout your career and your life when we spoke last time was uncertainty. So mm -hmm. describe how all of this relates to uncertainty. So... I feel bad for the student who's uh, this story is about because I've told it a thousand times, but it, it really was the starting point for me. So I had a student who came up to me in the second week he was working for me and he went, Dave, I have to apologize to you. And I said, oh, and he goes, nice, nice student. No reason to nothing. had just happened. And he goes, you've been asking for my opinion for the last week and a half. And I assumed you were lying because no adults ever asked me a question without already knowing the answer. Um, that to me describes the way we've developed our education system, right? We have a system where for a lots of reasons, we, um, tell students that questions have answers and their job as students is to discover the answer that the person in front of me already knows. So it's, it's just a hiding. So I have the answer. I'm hiding it from you and your job is to figure it out. That's sort of the game that we're playing. Um, and then like my friend, the bank manager, who I was talking to today, who is saying that she's increasingly finding that it's there are a lot of people who she's interviewing and who she's trying to train, who once they meet up, they run into a situation where their judgment is required, where they have to make a decision, they just freeze, right? And we've seen this in my conversations with the social work program, with the law program, and a whole bunch of other people where that ability to confront uncertainty is the thing that um, the students are struggling with the most. Um, I don't blame this generation. I don't think, I think that 
all of the things people have to decide all the time are partially to blame for this. Um, I also think that we've increasingly structured our education system to be um, analytic so that we can get data, that we can test it, so we can check to see if people are performing. And we've been forcing ourselves increasingly in that direction and that that has a huge impact on the way we think of learning because we think of learning as getting the right answer. But most of life is not like that. Like most of the decisions we make, should I have a cookie right now? I'd be really happy if I had a cookie. I could really like one. But, but we get um, stuck. We get stuck trying to come up with the right answer. Yeah. And it's just like, I mean, we're we're doing some traveling this year and several overnight flights, and we need neck pillows for sleeping on a plane. So my wife ordered twelve of them and said, "We're going to try all of these, and we're going to return the ones that we don't want." And did. they're they're sitting in a box, you know, on the other side of this wall, and. Somehow I have to come up with a way of evaluating these 12 different neck pillows now because reading the online reviews just wasn't enough. And, you know, when every, my, my kids struggle with that, right? Because every decision they make is, you know, they have to be right. And there's so many variables and so many factors that they just get paralyzed by that. And you know who tells you what's right? Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan tells you if something's right. Yeah, and to and me, that's the appeal. Right. Cuts to the chase. It's, yeah. mm -hmm. it's the certainty. Yes. The certainty. Yeah. In the way Chat it's GPT does that too. Yeah. Oh, that's very, huge. Sure very confident. Totally. And it apologizes, unlike Joe Rogan, it apologizes when you call it. <laughs> but I think that's that's the keystone, right? If we prepare you for certainty and then you don't find it, then you look for something that is certain. And you've had other demagogues in your country whose names I won't even mention. Um, who've made their business on just telling people the truth, even if it's even if it's patently the opposite thing that that person said two months ago. It doesn't matter as long as it tells me what I should do, mm -hmm. right? Because I'm accustomed to that kind of, and it, I, I think we're, we're training ourselves into that. I think it's, it's, there's a Pavlovian problem here um, where I well, think- Well, we're talking about neck pillow consumption and demagogues. <laughs> One of my takeaways, <laughs> one of my takeaways from the introduction <laughs> is that wow, this book doesn't seem particularly about education or technology. It seems more about societal systems and moral values. And like you talk about, I feel like there's this underlying tone about the corporate interests and in marketing. Mm -hmm. You talk about mm -hmm. the evolution of marketing. Yeah. You know, what is the difference between uh, Instagram? feeding me ads of minimalist hiking footwear or hair regrowth, which I find ageist and insulting because I've never <laughs> searched for that, but it still gives it to me versus Edward Morrow oh, selling cigarettes on his newscast. Right. What's the difference? What? Well, yeah. Like I got the sense that part of this transformational thing is that this has changed the where the role corporations yeah. are playing and marketing yeah. is playing is, has changed, but yeah. has it or how so? I mean, yes and no. Um, the technology that we have shapes the way, the things that people can do. So if you look at Barnays, who designed some of those ads, um, he understood radio before everybody else did. He understood that having a trusted voice could sell something way better than anything else. And that having a slogan spoken and even written, and there's a lot of that sort of text marketing as well, could make things true. Right. That if we get a slogan, if we put that together, the thing that we're saying becomes the truth. So the example I use in the book is uh, the di the diamond wedding ring that has to be two months salary. There's it's just something somebody made up and then did a bunch of ads for it. And TV was really good for that because you get the same thing everywhere. It's like you were saying earlier where you know, there's only three channels. So there's only three news networks. And so they all say the same thing. Then it's the same with this. Right. If the ad says the same thing everywhere afterwards, it starts to become part of the truth. Now little things can become like that and they're increasingly hidden, right? So it's not an obvious ad, have these lucky strikes and you can be as smart as I am, right? It's built into 27 paid TikTokers plus the 3000 people who are unknowingly copying those 27 paid TikTokers and are spreading it without being paid because they don't even realize that they're part of the marketing campaign. And it's coming in 
subconsciously, right? You're not seeing it in the same ways. It's hidden in all kinds of ways. Plus, instead of you getting marketed to um, through the, I won't go too far back, during the commercials at Jeopardy, which brings everybody in, <laughs> um, you're so that when you walk away from the television, you're no longer being marketed to in your house. Now you're being marketed to at every part of the place, right? Every time you try to do anything, um, you get hit. So I think it's the same thing they're trying to do, which is make money, but there's so many more tools and so many more ways of, of getting it done and so many more ways of slipping it in. So that's the technology. What about the corporate and governmental systems? Have they changed or they're? Well, some what? of them have. Um, so if you look at um, the information firms in Macedonia, like, holy baby, um, there are people who can be hired to do almost any, to, to push forward almost any agenda. Um, and there are certainly governments, Jeff, you'll remember, uh, who have approached some of your material even back in the 90s. Uh, you had some server problems based on some government influences back then. Um, so it's not like that's brand new. Like the internet's always had some of that. I think it's gotten more complex. I think increasingly there are anybody who is trying to convince you of something. So I, I don't want to make this sound tinfoil hat conspiracy. Like put it in, to put it in plain language to, 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 to finish up by doing the thing that Jen said I claimed to do in the first place. If you were try if your job was to try to convince somebody of something, wouldn't you use the internet? Um, and governments are in the business in some cases of trying to convince people of something. A lot of that, it's certainly in my country, I'll speak for mine, is good. They're trying to convince you to sort your garbage properly so more of it gets recycled. It's still being marketed, it's still like um what's the the economics term, the nudge marketing, like there's all that stuff that's happening. They're trying to do good. I'm just saying that not all governments are trying to do good at the same time and in the same ways. Some of them are not trying to do good. Or does good, good mean the same thing to everybody? To all people. Fair enough. I thank you for giving us the positive note there, Jeff. <laughs> well, I, that's not particularly positive. I think it's it, that's the more challenge. positive than what I said. <laughs> I mean, because you you talk about trying to make positive changes, but yeah. that's going to mean a lot of different things to different people. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yep. Expertise we'll have to find out in the next process. chapter. Yes. We'll have to find out in the next installment of Change Has Never Never Been a Bargain. <laughs> this is very good. All right. I think we brought it right to the end of the hour. Nice job. Any other questions we missed that from the introduction? Did you check the chat room? See if anybody put any questions in? Oh yes. We've we've forwarded them all. Okay, good. <laughs> Good. Just want to make sure we don't miss anybody. And I, I'd <laughs> like to thank our, our viewer, uh, who is probably one of us. <laughs> but uh, we will be back, I think, next week to talk about Chapter 1 the same time. Uh, and if anyone is watching this, thanks. Yeah, and if not, cheers. had a great discussion thanks, anyway. I bet, yeah. we sold, I bet we sold copies. <laughs> Fill in the blank. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to work on our marketing techniques. We've got to work on our marketing. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> got to get a TikTok version of this. <laughs> all right. And all of our viewers, stay tuned for the post show. Otherwise, see you next week. <laughs> that was fun. Yeah. You have to edit this now? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Start your sense of humor. <laughs> uh, edit. We were pretty perfect. That was a precision <laughs> operation. Balance the audio levels. Is that even a thing with uh, you'd have to? Yeah. I mean, yeah, I'll be. see if I can get the old uh, feeds going. Make sure that, like, because I mean, like, it's so easy to just toss up the video, but like, yeah. I still yeah. listen to podcasts and I don't know how friendly Ed Tech, we haven't, <laughs> Ed Tech Talk hasn't produced audio in quite a while. So this truly is a Drupal still? Is that like Drupal, <laughs> Drupal Mother F and Seven? Really? It's still wow. a thing chugging away. Wow. Ooh. Oh. Which I'm trapped. I mean, EdTech Talk probably could be updated without too much pain since we've already abandoned all the, the big issue with that was the audio embeds, but no one Gosh. listens to audio on a website anymore. Um, my career bridge site has all sorts of functionality that's really hard to make the jump from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8. I'm playing around with a backdrop, which is a new uh, open source CMS designed for Drupal 7 people who hate the upgrade. Mm -hmm. um, but that'll be my next staycation uh, thing. I found this is going way back. Do you remember when I moved over to WordPress from Drupal? There was like a little plugin. Audio carryover. 
It yes. was awesome. That's what I moved my website. Whatever. 15 years ago. Are know. you still okay with WordPress? No, oh, it is. I love it. Yeah, I still love WordPress. It works. Really for me. I use it all the time. Do you it's, use uh, the new WordPress or classic? Are you okay what? with blocks and Gutenberg and all that? Oh, yeah. I'm on, yeah. I'm on WordPress.com, so I don't have much of a choice. Oh. Yeah. Once you get your head around it, it's actually really good. Okay. It just takes it takes the time. Like you've got to really, you've got to approach it like you've never used the software before. And then just sit with it for a while. And then once you get it, you're like, oh, this is way faster. Just got to get there. I don't, I don't spend time trying to manage the blog. I go to the edit and create a post and put the stuff in there and post it. And it's not like, I don't mess around with sidebars and widgets and themes and like, all. Oh, I just do hickeys. Write the stuff. And yeah, I, I always said that when I implemented it in my schools, I, I implemented blogging software because I wanted teachers to be able to publish something as easy as sending an email. And that's kind of where I am now is like open up an editor on a web page, type in the thing. Yeah. Proofread it, post it. And a question we'll related to our Good idea. Uh, topic at hand. I proofread one of my one of my blogs, but not the other one. Gotcha. Um, you know, as I've listened to your other interviews and discussions, it's always a bunch of old dudes and maybe a few old gals. Where are younger people in this discussion? Have you had conversations about this with? not your students, but with the young generation of educators? <clears throat> um, you mean my students? No, I mean people who are teaching, educators. Well, they're going um, to be educators, but like, do you ever talk to them after they graduate? A little. I mean, I've only been teaching this group for two years, so it's a pretty small group. And I've got a group of educators here I know here because <laughs> half the theater community are educators. Well, like those are face-to-face -face people, but like you can go online and find a bunch of discussions about education. They're on TikTok. That's true. They're, they're, um, I think they're worried about different things. They're, they're certainly not looking at how do I infuse my teaching with technology, right? They're, that's not the right question. They're looking at inquiry they're looking at student engagement they're looking at project-based learning they're they're doing like those kinds of things and they are talking about those kinds of things but they're not doing it with us um it's a lot of you know in our schools there's a lot of book studies there's a lot of you know teacher groups getting together to work on things like that That's cool. um especially focused on at the primary building we're, we're talking a lot about what math instruction looks like and um that those have been fun conversations to have because they don't see me as a math teacher because they, you know, I'm just the tech guy. But um, right. so occasionally we'll surprise them by saying something that they're not expecting. But uh, I think those conversations are happening in schools and in, you know, little conferences. I think, um, you know, education conferences have changed a lot post COVID that we're not having these giant 4,000 people events where you're going for three days and doing all, you know, they're going to a local place, a, a school, a university for a, an afternoon or for, you know, a day and two thirds of those people are online. And so they're watching and interacting in you know, Zoom meetings. Yeah. So it's happening. I think that the, I've been frustrated by, um, the synchronicity needed in all of the tools. Like one of the things that I liked about Twitter after you three convinced me to join was that the people that I follow and the people that follow me are not the same group mm -hmm. because my teachers and my learners are two different groups of people. And most of the models, whether you're using a Google group for a community or you're using Slack or you're using whatever, it's, it's one group of people working together. And I struggle with that, that, I want people to be able to hear me, but I don't need to hear them. So Jeff, are you also saying like, um, you know, we have our 30, what do you say? 37,000 followers or whatever on Twitter. Mm -hmm. Are you saying like, where, where is the next generation going? Where, where is that 37,000 going? Is that also what kind of uh, not about? so much that, I mean, the 37,000, I think are kind of the old time ed tech 
talkers they're mostly gen x maybe a few millennials right uh and but a are lot you of saying like where's like that next generation? like where where is this conversation happening with the newer generation and john answered a lot it's happening in smaller conferences and in schools but like whenever you see someone posting a podcast or an online thing it's usually older folks you're i mean i do see younger tiktok educators or you know have you seen like how many people who are like 20 would you have on instagram jeff a lot because i friends with my students Oh, I, right. And I, I can't speak for how it's working in South Korea, so I can't say for sure. Here, at least, you won't, you'll see that they have five posts. Yeah. And they've it's all stories. For, yeah, it's all stories now. Nobody wants to make permanent contributions to the overall story. And I think there's a, I, I can't tell you that there's a real connection, but I, I, I bet you that that's part of the story too, is that people are loath to make the things that we just made because there was nobody else. Like there was 12 of us on the internet mm, at the time. But I think the like, this is a professional conversation. This isn't talking about lunch. If I'm posting about lunch, it might be a story, but like the content but they producers were who are talking about professional stuff are generally they making used to be more posts. permanent. They used right. to do them permanent. About lunch? Yeah. And now they've yeah. stopped. Yeah. So that, that I think they've really shifted in, in how, open they are to putting we've, we've told them not to but i think that um, kind of makes sense i mean personal stuff yeah. you might not want the permanent record but professional stuff generally i think people do even I worse they don't know. want to they've right. been told not to right for a generation because now i'm going to apply for a job and somebody's going to find this video and then they'll find something i said half an hour ago that they disagree with and i mean i had we had we have two new board members who started in january and one of them said i watched your webcast and I said, okay, oh. did I have to keep on? <laughs> yes. And I she laughed. Of and I, on. I said, I'm glad somebody watched it. Yeah. But like they, they're really afraid of those footprints. I think uh, unless you go to LinkedIn and it's hyper sanitized yeah. and you're bright and shiny and everything's great. <laughs> look at my promotion. Look at this that I published or whatever. Sorry, I, get, I get into my LinkedIn view here. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but I had people when I went through, I mean, even back in the old days when I was going through my master's and PhDs and I would post my work and I had faculty, they'd be like, well, A, I have assigned this every semester. So now you just shown, you know, how to answer this thing. So that wasn't great. But then I had a lot of students go, you know, we were talking about you know, stuff that you might want not want an employer to see. Um, I, like, for example, I hate group work. And so if someone wanted to hire me to design classes that had tons of group work. Well, they're like, well, she hates that. So we're not going to hire her. Um, That's right. Well, Dave has to go. And I have the, one of my last batches of conversations with my students set up Aww. in an hour. Sounds good. For you. Well, have a great week. I Did you guys enjoy doing this? Was this, oh, are we going to, oh, good. It feels weird to be the focus of this much talk. Uh, it feels kind of normal to me. It does. <laughs> Ouch. It does. That's my first question. Is What's wrong with just a webcast? <laughs> Why did you need a book? Why did I just want a book? <laughs> no, I'm kind of glad. I was a little, the chat was a bit quiet and I wasn't sure if, if folks were on board, but I enjoy this. I really enjoyed it. Well, maybe That's if great. we, maybe if we send a note out more than 25 minutes before. I especially like the part where Jennifer did all the work. Yeah, big fan of that. Big fan of that. I mean, You're that's the norm. Fan. No, no, Very Jeff, now you got to go play. No, 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 no. You, you, big fan. And you don't even need the elaboration. You can come up with five questions for each chapter right, and we'll just right. chime in. So good. They were really good. Can we call this the blah, blah, blah? Just call it the blah, blah, blah. Ed you guys just going to write blah, 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 and then I have oh, to Oh, God, I got to get in. another domain. <laughs> All right. See you guys next week. Ta-ta. Bye, guys. See you later. Hand to your kids, Dave. I will. See ya.